The measures that I've been talking about with Louis XIV certainly made France much stronger, but Louis knew that he would not be a, a great king unless powers outside of France thought of him as a great king. So it's important for a king to, to seek glory, because that is where it is meant to be a great king. He, he fights wars because he's seeking glory. Between 1661 and 1715, a period of 54 years, he's at war for 35 of them. So 65% of his reign during this time period is dedicated to war. He did not lead his armies into battle, but he enjoyed the spectacle of it. These wars were not known for their great battles, but were usually wars of position, where armies would try to outmaneuver one another. The great feature of the wars was the besieging of the fortress. When fortresses were besieged not terribly far from, from Paris, like say in Belgium, Louis would take his entire court, ladies, gentlemen, mistresses, servants, uh, and they go and they go watch the war. If the, French, the fortress fell while he was present, he would bask in even greater glory. And commanders tried to take fortresses when he was present. Louis might have fought the wars for glory, but the countries that fought against him fought him because they feared him. He fought against England, Holland, Austria, Spain, and various German states, and they were all scared to death of him. In fact, the last of his wars, which also was the largest and longest, the War of Spanish Succession, was a world war. It was not only fought in the European continent, but also in North America and on the high seas. In this war, Louis had virtually all of Europe against him, but he was still able to hold his own. Louis established his power at home by creating a strong government to enforce his wishes, and he established his power by making war abroad. But Louis also knew that there was another method for a king to, to enhance his own power, and that was spectacle. One of his most prominent ministers said on one occasion, if a king does not win wars, he should at least build great buildings. And Louis did build great buildings. The most magnificent of them all was his palace at Versailles, which is often considered the greatest palace built by any king. It's located just outside of Paris, and it's enormous, with polished mirrors, glowing chandeliers, rugs, and spectacular furniture. A large garden with waterworks all over the place, and at the bottom is a, is a lake, large enough for mock naval battles. But there was a much more of a method to his madness. He wanted to build, have a building so magnificent that it was simply all anybody who came by. The, the nobles who came to know who would come would know that they could not build anything so grand and so would be persuaded that the king was truly powerful. And the location was calculated well. Remember the story about Louis in the, during the Fronde that the people were walking through his bedroom? He wanted his palace outside of, of, of Paris, away from the stinking common people. But he also wanted to be away from the mob. He did not want to give Parisians a chance to go through his bedroom once more. The purpose of this incredible structure, therefore, was to serve as a stage upon which Louis would be the principal actor, and he would act as a king. From the time that he grew, woke up in the morning to the time he was tucked in at night, Louis was on a stage. Getting out of bed and putting on his dressing gowns was a great ceremony uh, for his, his nobles. Getting up required the entry of six different peoples at various times. Functions at dressing were so carefully staged that one official was in charge of holding the right sleeve of Louis's dressing arm, dressing gown, excuse me, when he put it on in the morning. If you think this is the ultimate in vanity, a man surrounding himself with all these people, demanding that he was demanding to be waited upon a foot hand and foot much each day, there actually is some sort of madness here or a method. There were no these noblemen were dressed the king every day, saw to his bath needs. It was always a method in the madness. He knew that if a man was standing next to him, helping with him with his, his, his dressing gown, that same man would not be out fomenting rebellion. He deeply distrusted his noblemen, and he wanted to make certain that they hung around him so they could, they could know where they were at all times. Now, you might be wondering, and you, you can understand why the king would create such a spectacle. But you might also be wondering why the French nobleman would put up with it. Why would a French nobleman try to get in the position of holding the king's dressing gown? Why would he stoop to such a low? The reason is that, th that this was the time to ask the king for favors. Let's say you wanted the government to do something for you, like put, a, put you in a position in the army, or a favor for a young son or nephew, uh, or the son of a good friend. A way to do it was to ask the king for it. 
But the king was not really interested in reading petitions or letters from his noblemen. He wanted to be asked in person. At every stage in the elaborate ceremony surrounding the king, there was an opportunity to ask for a favor. In fact, asking favors were so common that there were specific times during, say, dressing in the morning when people would, could ask for favors, and at that time the others would turn away and pretend not to listen. Louis wanted to make certain that the great men of France would be asking him for those favors. If they were whispering in his ear, they weren't home plotting rebellion. He would grant some favors, but not others. The worst thing he could possibly say was, I don't know that man. In other words, the person who wanted the favor asked to stay around Versailles for a little bit more. Louis wanted to see him in the crowd. That way, he would know that the guy was not up there causing trouble. Louis is the greatest of the absolute monarchs. He set the standard. Kings and queens all over Europe copied the things he did, from reforming their armies to creating magnificent palaces. They tried to limit the nobility of, sorry, the power of the nobility of the estates of separate law courts and of the church. They tried to make their governments more efficient and their economies better. They fought wars in case, in some cases for glory, in some cases for conquest, and sometimes they had to fight wars to fend off Louis XIV himself. So, but Louis was even more of a contributor to Western civilization than just a quintessential absolute monarch. He accelerated the process of the growing power of the state. From now on until the, perhaps the end of the 20th century, the growing power of the f central government continues. And so the second thing that he does is he makes French the language of civil, civil, civilized people in Europe. From now on until the end of the Second World War, French was considered the language of culture and of diplomacy and, and international affairs. Anyone who is anyone had to speak French, not Latin anymore. France replaced the language France replaced Latin as the language of the cultured, and it would remain so until its replacement of by English in our own time.